Good evening. The Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering and Management, together with the Institute for Engineering Leadership and the Office of Alumni Relations and Development, welcome you, both audience gathered here and online, to the NUS Engineering Distinguished Leaders Lecture 2021. We are honored to have with us today Ms. Jessica Tan, Ping An Group Co-CEO and Board Executive Director. When I broached the idea to Jessica early last year on sharing her experiences on leadership and technology transformation to our engineering students and alumni, she was very enthusiastic and quick to agree despite her busy schedule. Unfortunately, COVID hit us and we had to wait a year for this. Today, the restrictions from COVID still remains, and although we can only accumulate a small, accommodate a small live audience here, we have a large online audience, including many students and several classes logged into our webinar this evening. Ms. Jessica Tan has, credit, has been credited with leading the digital transformation in the eight years at Ping An. In that time, the group has grown into the fifth largest global financial conglomerate with 598 million online users and 218 million financial customers. Ping An has made major strides in technology and innovation, now having established eight research institutes with over 110,000 technology staff, including 33,000 R&D staff and 3,000 data scientists, leading to over 31,000 applied technology patents. Ping An Group has incubated technology businesses, now four publicly listed, with annual revenues of more than 14 billion US dollars and market cap of over 68 billion US dollars. During this period, Jessica personally incubated and managed a number of them, including Lufax, China's leading technology powered personal financial services platform with 149 million active users, 68 billion US dollars in assets under management, and 84 billion US dollars in outstanding loans. And Ping An Good Doctor, China's leading online healthcare services platform with an extensive network of over 3,700 hospitals, including nearly 2,000 tier three hospitals and 151,000 pharmacies, now with over 373 million registered users and have processed over 1 billion online consultants. Consultations. The list goes on and it will take the rest of the evening to read out all of uh, Jessica's many achievements. And I'm sure we are all eagerly awaiting the inside view of Ping An's transformation from Jessica. So without further ado, may I invite Jessica to the rostrum to deliver her lecture. Jessica, please. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Suhui, for the kind words. Um, and, uh, you know, indeed, when we started this about a plus year ago, we thought um, it would be interesting to share. Uh, myself and the engineering student, I was uh, electrical engineering and computer science. Um, and then, uh, you know, to share actually what engineering as a, as a mindset and skills are actually, you know, can be very, very useful and very exciting. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity first to introduce uh, my colleagues as well. Uh, we have uh, Bin Ru, who's with me. Um, we have three tech companies here. She's the CEO of our tech companies here, and she's also a proud alumni uh, of uh, NUS. Uh, and then uh, my other colleague, uh, Tian Beng, uh, you know, he's, um, he used to be the CEO of uh, Parkway Singapore, and he just joined us over a year ago in China. Uh, he now is uh, actually leading our 12th latest uh, startup uh, in healthcare uh, in China. Uh, so very exciting. Uh, so uh, without, maybe I'll just start off. Uh, I wanted to share maybe the next half hour uh, a bit of more first-hand experience uh, of my eight years uh, in China with Ping An, uh, some of the exciting things that uh, we've been doing, uh, some successful, some not so successful, uh, but you know, it's just amazing as you look back, you know, what can actually be done in just eight years' uh, time. Uh, so I'll start off first, maybe uh, everyone, some pictures so you can see a little bit uh, for those either remotely or in, in person. Uh, I'm sure you have seen pictures of Shenzhen in 1988 before. Uh, Shenzhen is where our company was founded. Our company was also founded in 1988 uh, by our current founder and chairman, uh, Ma, uh, with just 13 people. Right? Uh, and if you, uh, you know, know where Shenzhen is at that time, fish, really fishing village, and I just finished reading a book, um, you know, about Yuan Geng. You know, uh, you know, 30, 40, in 1988 at that time, there were still bodies washed up the shores. 
of people trying to swim uh, from uh, Shenzhen to Hong Kong uh, at that time. Uh, so it was a very, very different uh, Shenzhen. Uh, in 2013, like, uh, which was when I, I joined uh, Peng An, uh, just eight years ago, um, you, know, you see already Shenzhen being very different, right? um, not just in terms of GDP, you know, population, a completely different uh, world is one of the economic miracles and that's more you know, a true test of what China economic reform has done. Uh, even Peng An then, uh, we, were, we were big, uh, but still not as big as today. Right? Uh, if you look at it, uh, we have about 750,000 employees at that time. And when I joined, we only had 3,000 uh, developers. Um, and within eight years, you know, this is how exciting it can be. Um, you know, Shenzhen itself has grown uh, significantly, as you can see. Even electric cars, I put this particularly as a measure because everyone's very hot on electric cars. Um, because of various regulation that the government has done a really good job, now uh, one third of the cars are electric. In fact, in cities, because of all the congestion and they give incentives for those who can come uh, during city peak hours, half of the cars are electric. Right? And this is just done you know, within a span of just eight years. Um, and for us today, we are also very different. You see the picture in the middle. You might not be able to see the whole Futian area in Shenzhen. Uh, you know, was not very developed at that time. Uh, in just eight years, it's changed. Uh, our old headquarters building, uh, you see in the middle picture, the below um, picture, was actually a uh, factory uh, that we, basically, one of our customers, uh, the factory, got, they bankrupt and they gave us the factory. That was our old headquarters. Today, we, our headquarters uh, is the um, fourth tallest building in the world, uh, which is the little iconic tower there with 118 floors. This is all done uh, within just eight years. Okay. And I want to share a little bit, uh, you know, how we have managed to do that. Uh, and, you know, and we've been made a, a case study in many of these uh, areas whereby, I mean, you cannot find a more traditional company like, you know, insurance company, which we, was what we started. Uh, and over our 32 years of history, we started first as insurance company with 13 employees then to broaden it out to banking and asset management. Uh, and then the last 12 years, we expanded ex uh, you know, increasingly into technology. Uh, we changed our logo to finance and technology company. Today, of our total subsidiary, our first level subsidiaries of about 32, 11 of them are actually tech companies. Uh, you know, and we have seven listed companies, of which four are tech listed companies. Uh, and this is why, and why do we do uh, tech? We believe in tech um, in three, Areas. One is that, you know, uh, 12 years ago already, uh, we believe that tech technology is core to transforming our business. Right? Uh, so that was very necessary. Then, um, then after that, the second phase we went into, we used tech to create new B two C direct business. Right? Uh, like Lufax, uh, which is wealth management. Uh, like Good Doctor, which is the largest mobile uh, portal in China, like Lotto Home, which is the largest car portal uh, in China. Uh, then the third phase, we went even further, uh, whereby we took up technology and not just used for ourselves, but today we actually use sell software uh, to the whole industry. Uh, so uh, Binru that I introduced earlier heads our OneConnect uh, fintech company in Southeast Asia. Uh, OneConnect uh, has just been formed for five years. We serve 680 banks today in China and 20 other countries outside of China, uh, as well as uh, 100 over insurers and 3,000 financial institutions. All this is done only uh, within five years. Uh, so I think that's kind of a little philosophy of why we believe technology can not just change ourselves, but can reshape change for how consumers as well as whole industry ecosystem could be. I would, these are some numbers right, for those because I understand today has a very diverse audience uh, listening in right, to give a sense of, you know, people ask about ROI, business case and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of things you have to look at it you know, in strike, um, be it you know, in any of the metrics today, uh, market cap, assets, just in the past eight years we are talking about a, a few multiple times. Uh, and it's just exhilarating and very rewarding as you look through this. Um, you know, but it is not easy. Right? Uh, if you look at what our scale uh, numbers are, you know, when you are running a very, very large organization, uh, we have 1.41 million employees. One million of them are our agents. Uh, I have about 60, uh, well, we used to have 80,000, now we reduced to about 
50, 60,000 contact center agents. Uh, every day we make 6 million calls. I used to joke to my team, you know, I can call all of Singapore in just one day. Uh, you know, and when you run in such a scale at the numbers that you see here, technology is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential if you want to deliver consistent, you know, tailored service you know, to our 598 million users on our mobile, as, you know, and then you have to do this at scale with technology. That's the reason why I said we started the journey uh, with making so much investment uh, in technology. And the benefits, as you can see, uh, from a customer standpoint, is very significant. Uh, when, when I first started uh, about in 2013, eight years ago, uh, we are very traditional financial services. We are very well run, but like most financial services and most traditional industries you will find, is that you have a set of customers. At that time, we have 80 million. Uh, financial services customers, and a subset of them uses our internet or, or mobile app. Right? So 80 million customers, 50 million of them are on our app or internet PC at that time. Right? In just eight years, we made a significant decision at that time that we say we have to go and say mobile first. We really meant mobile first. Uh, we basically went all out and said that if our customer is not on a mobile app, uh, we, we will not count this to our KPIs in our companies. And you can see very dramatically from second year onwards, not our internet online customers you know, increase now 12 times over the past eight years. And that changes the whole dynamics of our industry. Right? And financial services and many traditional industry, you first become a customer of ours, so you, you buy a product from us, then we give you service. That's the traditional way of thinking it. One of the reasons we made this mobile is because we believe that, you know, in the new, if you look at how the internet economy has gone, these days consumers want to be surfaced before they buy something. And this was a completely different mindset, right? Uh, which is why we push everything on the app. Today you can become a user of ours first, and then over time, if you like our service, you will buy more and more products for us. Uh, when we tested, we've now done this for eight years. In the first four years, it was very difficult to show a business case. It was a lot of investment, a lot of problems. You know, we had tons of apps, you know, apps that we tried making super app, you know, and then they say it's one super app's too bulky, we then distribute back into various apps, but we have widgets that allows the consumer to drop into various of our businesses. In the, to, in the past four and a half years, you see that this model through years and years and hard work and integrating that with the rest of our one million agents and offline channels, we've made that work. Because now for the past four and a half years, consistently, 35 to 40% of our new financial services customers come from these so-called internet app users. So these days, so you can see the huge potential, right? We have truly created a retail ecosystem you know, over the past eight years, whereby out of our 598 million app users, 400 million of them still don't yet have a financial services products for us. Right? Uh, so the potential is huge and it's very synergistic. I think this is why you hear a lot of Chinese players talk about ecosystem, ecosystem, but everyone's idea of how you create ecosystem is very different. Uh, and for us, it is about bringing together various different services and through the mobile, linking that uh, together. It takes a lot of perseverance to do it, um, but you will see how it changes dramatically. Right? Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the, our group, how we look like. I said we have about 32 first level subsidiary. If you count all our company, we have probably a thousand over companies. Uh, you know, we are now the you know, global fortune 21st uh, you know, in the world. Uh, you know, by profit, we're actually the largest non-state owned company in China uh, by profit. Um, but you see the pillar on the right hand side these are all the new tech companies that we've incubated over the past eight plus years. Right? Uh, everything was started from scratch. It's very difficult uh, to incubate a company when we start off. Um, you know, but you know, from 50 people, now easily all of them uh, add together. We have a few tens of thousands of you know, uh, employees. That's the way we were saying uh, earlier. Uh, and then we managed to take some of the companies basically publicly uh, listed. Um, and that's all in a very, very short time span. So, so I think that's kind of a setup, if you will, 
to give you the background the story of what can be done across uh, in eight years. Uh, you know, if you're uh, aggressive enough, if you really try hard at, at doing a lot of things. Uh, but the, the payback is not easy, right? It takes years, as I said. You know, for the first four or five years, we were net investing. Only in the past three, four years have we really seen kind of, you know, synergistic effect. I wanted the next part, show some specific examples, right? Uh, both in how we built this whole core ecosystem in terms of our core technologies. You know, why we as a financial services company choose to actually build our own AI, our own blockchain and stuff. Um, and then some of the applications in financial services, in healthcare, in smart city, which, you know, I just lifted a few of the examples in the you know, thousands that we do. But you will find that these examples are very easy to understand, very compelling, not just in relevant in China, but in any of the countries. Uh, and how that's why, you know, uh, either students or alum, uh, you know, or myself and others, we're very passionate uh, about what are the opportunities out there that technology uh, can actually help solve. Yeah. So with the core technologies, uh, Sui mentioned, uh, we chose eight years ago when I joined uh, that we must have our own core technologies. The reason is, is very simple. Uh, for, for those of you who maybe uh, you know, do a lot of AI and stuff, you know AI is not a new thing. It's been around for 60 plus, you know, almost 70 years. Uh, there has been many predictions along the way about the event of AI, right? Uh, if I count, I think there were at least two big kind of predictions of boom and then didn't work. Why is it that we believe now the third evolution will actually work? Uh, it's because now we have the good computing power. We do have data uh, digitized. Uh, we have good modelers and people that can actually make it work. Right? Uh, but it, it requires a lot of hard work. It's not like uh, I buy an AI and then you know, I can use it. It's about really integrating how the business domain knowledge and the technology together, with getting different mix of people to actually create the solutions. That's all why we created our own core technology, because you know everyone can have AI these days. AI is like democratized. Even my daughter can build a deep learning model. Uh, but it's how you integrate that, and therefore you need to have your own core competency. You see our patents too. Uh, Sui mentioned we have over 31,000 uh, patents uh, submitted globally. 96% uh, are all invention patents. I, I deliberately put this chart on the left to show to you it is a long-term investment. When I joined, there were only six patents submitted uh, in our entire group. You know, even the first few years as I hired more and more data science, it takes a while. But you can see in the past three years, we just dramatically, dramatically increased. As you build that core ecosystem where you have scenarios, you have data, you have people working together to do it, the, the curve is exponential, right? uh, and it's been very exciting and rewarding seeing that uh, due today. Today we are ranked uh, for the past three years uh, in fintech and health tech number one globally, uh, and then in AI and blockchain. The, um, my chairman is very aggressive. He told me that he would like us to be number two in AI globally this year, uh, which uh, you know, I'm sure we will be able to reach there uh, as well. Look, this is what a lot of people have, you know, what is really AI. Um, I use this as an example of one of our research institutes, what we do. Uh, at the beginning, a lot of people focus on AI, you know, on recognition, right? Uh, like facial recognition, voice recognition. You know, you see, you are able to listen, you're able to speak. Right? Um, and we, we became really good at doing this. But in the, in the world, as my chief data scientist explained to me, you know, this is like a baby. This in the world of true AI learning is like a baby because my baby, when she was a toddler, could learn how to recognize Papa, Mama's face. You know, they can speak words. They say cat is a cat. But these are very basic foundation. Now, we also need this basic foundation so that we're able to speak. Uh, I mentioned that we make 6 million calls inbound and outbound every day. Today, 82% 80, of all our service calls are done by our voice and text robots. 47% of all our sales calls are done by our voice and text robots. And even collections, uh, we collect people who owe us money, 27% uh, are done by our voice and uh, text robots. It took us three, four years to train it uh, by taking the best 10% people on how they speak, you know, for different products, different scenarios, different customers, what script, what voice, what tone you should be using uh, to be able to train them. And today, our voice robot exceeds 
the average, um, the average uh, contact center agent. So these are basics. But what is the real important thing is the knowledge behind. Being able to build what I just said, the in-depth domain knowledge. We have been able to do that in financial services. We have been able to do that even in healthcare doctors. Um, you know, and we've been, we are now trying to do that in education. Uh, we're actually taking the K-12 curriculum uh, in China, uh, all the function points of different subjects, mapping it into different knowledge points, what are the questions that you test, et cetera. We're trying to build that uh, together so that you know, we'll have these deep uh, knowledge graphs for everything. And this is an example uh, in uh, AI for healthcare. Uh, we have an AI doctor called Asbop. Uh, he's been actually taking part in competition. Uh, in fact, last year we create, uh, you know, did a kind of alpha goal like uh, competition with uh, uh, top beta uh, uh, university uh, hospital, uh, you know, whereby the top tier universities, we have cardiologists who competed with our. Uh, AI doctor asked Bob. Uh, and it's a blind test. It's really like the Turing test in some sense. Uh, we have basically nine cardio specialists and our doctor, you know, and then for every patient case, you know, uh, they will diagnose and then they will prescribe, right? And then the judges have no idea whether the answer came from a cardiologist or from our ASPOP doctor. Uh, and in this blind test, our ASPOP doctor won 97.7 versus the cardio specialists of 93.9. With the exception of only one out of nine cardio specialists who scored higher than our um, uh, ASPOP, the rest are not. Now you might see, does that mean we have no more cardiologists, no more doctors? That's not true. Uh, that is not the purpose of why we do all these things. Because there is a scarcity of professional talents, experienced talents all over the world. Uh, particularly in large countries like China. We only have 3.8 million doctors for 1.4 billion people. Right, so what we find is that combining what technology is very good at basically scanning through massive amount of information uh, and the human judgment right, is the best pairing. So today we have 650,000 doctors in China using uh, our tool. So I wanted to move on then to FinTech, health tech. Those are the core technologies and why we built them. And then in FinTech, I think we use it in a variety of places. Right? We use it in sales. Uh, when you have a million agents and they sell everything, our um, agents sell from life insurance, credit card, cars, houses, uh, even good doctor, medical services. Uh, we had to come up with a very specialized ways. Not all the agents are the same. How do you train them? We are very famous for innovating globally. The first AI interview we're at. Right? We have to interview you know, uh, a few tens of millions of people every year for the agents. We used to have 3,000 dedicated interviewers just interviewing all year round. And now we created an AI interview app. Uh, you actually talk to our things so that you actually can explore what your interests and problems are. And we've been doing that for three years now. Um, we use AI to help basically our agents better to sell, manage the customers, how do you train. We do it for lending. Risk management is one of the core bedrock uh, for financial services. Uh, when we disperse an average size loan of about um, a few hundred thousand, and we're able to do it completely remotely to an SME owner, uh, using both our risk model as well as our uh, uh, it's an interview video camera tool like, uh, on our app. Uh, and we looked at questions, uh, make sure that you're not lying. You know, there are these micro expressions that support, you know, sounds a little bit science fictiony, but you know, it's made it work. Uh, we disperse about you know, uh, 80 billion US dollars loans every year. These are unsecured loans, okay? uh, so I don't need collateral or anything. And our um, NPL ratio for those, those uh, basically delinquency rates right, are very, very low, uh, comparable to others that are actually collateralized. We do it for claims. Uh, we're the second largest car insurer. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we're the first one to pioneer about four years ago, whereby if you get into an accident, um, you know, 80, 86%, you can just take an app and then you basically take a 360 degree video across uh, your car and they will automatically educate how much it is uh, and will pay you and you want to repair yourself or send to our vendor. Today, we not just use ourselves, but Guan I mentioned, offer it to 50 other insurers in China. We also, in fact, gave it to, uh, sold it to traffic police. Uh, 
uh, Shenzhen today, um, you know, their traffic, their accident for the traffic police is actually done by our technology. Uh, we are now in about 20 odd cities in China doing this. Uh, and that dramatically reduced the time to clear an accident uh, because it used to take, during peak hours, 40 minutes to clear the accident site, even when no one is hurt. And now it takes less than three minutes to do so. Uh, and then finally, the voice robot I mentioned in our contact center, where now we see it as a very necessary because lots of people still like to call, and how do you combine that knowledge together? And now today, as I mentioned earlier, for fintech, we don't just use it for ourselves. We're constantly generating more and more projects and innovation cases every year. And then we also offer that to the whole ecosystem because we believe these are common problems that we don't, not just we face, but other financial institutions globally face. Uh, and it's been a very exhilarating and uh, you know, meaningful kind of growth that we looked at. And then this is another area for those who have financial services. It's not just improving how a financial institution works better. It actually create new business models out. Right? Uh, so this is an example. We talk about trade. Right? Uh, and we all know trade, intra-Asia trade is becoming much more important. With the globalized supply chains and stuff, more than half of the intra-Asia trade are actually done by SMEs. Right? Uh, but there's a lot of barriers, etc., to getting through these. Uh, we built a blockchain trade platform linking customs, linking banks, linking foreign exchange ports. Uh, we are now linking seven different ports in um, Greater Bay Area so that Hong Kong, Macau, Chinese ports can do one-time transshipment. Right? They already do 1.5 trillion tons uh, a year. Uh, and I think this will help dramatically uh, to streamline trade and promote it. I wanted to spend uh, a few minutes on health, uh, which is also a very exciting area uh, that we look at. Uh, and you know, in China, there are some really big numbers uh, here. Uh, you know, be it in demand, um, you know, we always look at Japan as an aging society, but actually in China, there are 176 million uh, old people, uh, five times more than in Japan. Uh, this is a problem for China as well as in Singapore uh, as well. And when your life expectancy increase much more, costs increase, how are you able to afford that? Uh, and in supply in China, there's not enough uh, doctors, I mentioned, not enough nurses. Uh, everyone crowds all to the tier three hospitals. How do you balance that? Um, and then finally, how do you make this affordable? Uh, because the cost is really rising significantly. So for us, healthcare is a big area. Uh, we actually have 12 of our 32 units working on healthcare. And we looked at when you want to solve healthcare in any country, it's a very holistic problem. Uh, you have to look at patient, provider, payer, through the government and stuff. Uh, so I'll give a few examples of how we actually do that, right? The first thing, for example, we do online healthcare. Uh, we were the first uh, pioneer to do that. Uh, Good Doctor is a company that we listed in Hong Kong. We created that about seven years ago. Uh, it's now the largest mobile health portal. Um, we normally have 2,000 over our own doctors online doing it uh, through app, uh, but we also work with 20 over 1,000 doctors um, in the system. And every, every day, Right, uh, we have 900,000 consultations uh, online. You know, at the beginning, it was a very dumb thing whereby you ask a single question, our doctors, you know, our nurses will answer you, uh, you know, one by one. Over the past uh, basically seven years, 75% now are trained uh, and answered by our AI assistant. Uh, and I think this is what you can see. We believe now in China, only about three to four percent of all healthcare consultations are online. This number has the potential to be 20, 30 percent. Right? Uh, and you look at how telemedicine, you know, even in the US, is still a very small percentage. But with the right kind of incentive structure and knowledge, you can actually give much better and more accessible healthcare uh, online. The other thing we do in healthcare, for example, we work with the government because, you know, in many countries like China, the bulk is actually in the public healthcare system. The best doctors are there, but it's quite poorly run and heavily subsidized. Uh, so we have another unit in smart healthcare. We now work with over 158 cities. Uh, we help them, particularly in this pandemic, uh, you know, in the all of um, uh, Hubei province uh, and Wuhan as well, in the whole Guangzhou province. We help the um, Ministry of uh, health equivalent uh, on how do you monitor all kind of sites so that if there are any better control uh, and first time alert uh, in any tiers of the cities. Uh, our spot I mentioned, uh, the doctor has now used over 650,000 doctors because we want to improve the quality because otherwise they don't really stick 
you know, to the rules. It's, you know, so it's from 50%, we can increase that actually to about 80, 90%. Okay, and then, you know, it, how do you change? You know, it's a very complex problem, the, paying, the payment of it, right? So today in China, 55% of the healthcare costs are borne by the government. You know, uh, out of pocket, it's about, six, uh, it's about 40 over percent, and the 6% are commercial insurance. But that cannot last, right? How do you combine? So we're revamping how commercial insurance works. You know, we combine service together so that you don't come to us uh, when you're already sick. Uh, you know, we start from day one. That's why we have, you know, um, health monitoring uh, and management. We have uh, diabetes uh, management right at the beginning. We find that if you work with us, we have now over a million diabetes patients on our app, uh, whereby you can actually actively monitor and your HbA1, ABC, AC will actually improve uh, you know, dramatically after six, uh, three months because you stick to it and it's linked with our doctors. So I think that's kind of on the healthcare. And in the interest of time, I may not be able to cover all smart city, but smart city is a new area we just started in three years ago. Uh, we're very passionate about this. You can ask why is a financial services company looking you know, beyond fintech, health tech, to smart city. We believe that urbanization is very, very important, increasingly so. Right? Um, you know, because people like to live in cities. Uh, if you look at China, you have these mega cities it's not slowing down the rate of urbanization, but it's actually increasing even, even more. But if you look at most cities, you know, uh, there's a lot of good hardware, but not enough good software to actually manage and run the cities you know, efficiently. So our belief is that how can you use about three, four years ago, we looked at how can we use technology to help cities run better. Um, and so we are now, you know, within about four years, we are already in 115 cities all over China. We help them from anything to manage the city better, uh, to how do you promote business development, to how do you deliver citizen services um, you know, efficiently uh, to them. So these are a few examples. Traffic management I mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, I gave Shenzhen just to be easier to relate. Uh, you know, Shenzhen, we've been working with them for three years on smart traffic management. Shenzhen today is the safest uh, city uh, but on, in terms of traffic accidents all over China, is safer than even Singapore. Uh, for every 1,000 vehicles, they only have 0.61 deaths versus 0.87 in Singapore. Uh, not just, and all the traffic violations, I can't speed in uh, Shenzhen. Uh, we don't have a speed camera to tell you, actually, the speed camera is coming up. Uh, even if you didn't stop at the zebra line, you are automatically being caught. Now, of course, there are various um, disputes about surveillance and etc. but, you know, the effectiveness is fantastic. Uh, we have reduced accident rates and stuff. Uh, environment uh, protection, which is a big uh, thing. We talked about ESG, we talked about sustainability. But for a very long time, you cannot solve, not just in China, but in many of the emerging, you know, or Asia, who, has, you know, who pollutes because you pollute into the river. You can't catch who is it that pollutes. Right? So everyone, you know, especially small businesses, they will go with the view that, okay, you know, let me take that risk. If I get caught, you know, I'll get uh, penalized and stuff. Uh, so what we did was we actually built with, I gave these all our Shenzhen examples so you can relate. Over the past two years, we worked with them all the, every one kilometer square grid. We looked at which are the country, companies, what type of companies, what kind of pollutants. We have over 200 different pollutants. The companies have to, re not just IoT report, they actually have to take an app and actually submit data every, every day. Uh, and then we also looked at you know, along the river, which part, so it's now one of the cleanest rivers uh, in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, and then citizen services. Uh, you know, Singapore does very well uh, with our Sing Pass and Singapore services. Uh, you know, in China, for example, Shenzhen, uh, you know, 14 million uh, of the population is on the app, uh, which has worked remarkably well over the past one and a half years, in particular with COVID. Now, 50% 50, 50 of all the citizen services are done now through the app. Like, uh, so dramatically reduce the need you know, to face-to-face. -to -face, uh, and you can do everything. Uh, it's not expanded linked to our transport. You can take uh, the train, uh, the buses, uh, all your benefits, pensions, completely through an app. It forces also the bureaucracies within the government. We have seen that you know because we have to work with 50 different departments uh, in the government because it forced them to streamline their services much more. Uh, and this is, has huge uh, impact. And then finally... Um, some of the you know, further out things that we're doing, education, uh, home, uh, kind of uh, elderly home care. Uh, these are things that we are currently working on. 
uh, on education or how do you combine online, uh, not just for young children, but vocational training. Uh, we have now the second largest vocational online training uh, platform in China uh, with a few tens of millions of uh, users. We think this is something that can be shaped also how people learn and continue to grow. Uh, and then, of course, smart elderly home care, which is a very important topic. Lots of people have been looking into it. Uh, we now have a few experiments whereby, you know, lots of people, especially Asian elderly, want to stay in their own homes. They don't want to go to, you know, a centralized home. But how do you use technology to make sure all the services and the healthcare are linked properly? Uh, so these are the things that we are working on. Uh, you know, some of them a little bit more mature, some of them still exploratory. But nonetheless, we see huge potential and impact. And that's what keeps driving us to do more and more. And then finally, I wanted to end uh, just on time in about half hour. Uh, I wanted to share, I think this was in, we tried to condense a lot uh, within half an hour. Uh, but really, it boils down to three things. I think the first one is that actually there's a lot of interesting problems and opportunities in this world. You know, things, no matter what industry, which country, what role you have, there's lots of things, you know, that's what we are actually put on this world to do. Two, there's a lot of problems if you keep looking at it. It can persist for decades. You know, some of the problems I talk about, not enough doctors, not enough teachers, pollution problems, these are decades. Even before my generation, you know, people talk about uh, that. And somehow not being able to solve it. Not being able to solve it doesn't mean that it cannot be done. As I've shown you, with the right amount of incentives, you know, with good kind of support resources, you work harder and you find the right stakeholders who are willing to take you know, bets to do it, you can make huge impact and it's very much replicable. Right? And then thirdly, you know, I wanted to end with this point uh, you know, about expertise making life easier, that's our motto. Uh, you know, and then we want to make sure that technology makes life uh, better. And I think um, you know, this is hopefully something that will inspire all uh, to share and try more. Uh, I think it's not about being successful or failure. I think the ability, once you try, you'll find that more and more, a lot of things we learn through doing it. Uh, when we first started Smart City, I was very skeptical uh, at first. Um, you know, uh, being trained as a you know, consultant, I was very cynical of lots of things. You give me any problem, I can find dozens of reasons why it will not work. Uh, but you've learned to now be a more entrepreneurial uh, mindset. Uh, and you know, it's amazing as you look back what actually can be done, uh, and you keep improving better and better. Uh, so with that in mind, I thank you very much for spending uh, your Friday evening and afternoon uh, with us, uh, and hopefully this uh, will be uh, useful to some of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tan. That was a very phenomenal transformation story of Pinan that you shared with us through your inspiring talk. Now it's time for question and answer. May I request Professor C.C. Hung, our Executive Director of IEL, to moderate the session. So people in the audience here, you can raise your hands and Alena and I will bring the mic to you. You can introduce yourself a little bit and ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Wow, first uh, let me thank uh, Ms. Tan for her very generous sharing. Um, when we first came in to, uh, to listen to her, we thought that uh, she's going to share with us something on uh, Ping An's uh, technology transformation. But within this half an hour, she told us much more than that. You s she mentioned about business model. She mentioned about uh, Ping An using such technology to create new businesses, create uh, new services, and so on. So to me, this is really outstanding corporate entrepreneurship. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Tan again uh, for sharing not just tech transformation, but also corporate entrepreneurship with us. Um, we have uh, audiences here as well as online. Uh, perhaps I will now start to, uh, start the, uh, to uh, open up the floor for questions. Uh, we have the one there. First one, please. Hi, uh, good evening. I, I really enjoyed your uh, sharing. It's, it's very inspiring. Um, I'm Hun Ping. I used to be the Chief Executive of Land Transport Authority, alumni of uh, NUS. Uh, right now, I'm the CEO of the Fair Price Group supply chain dealing with food supply chain. Now, at a personal level, I also found it not so easy to pivot from one to the next. 
And I find it very amazing, right, that you started off with financial and also insurance type of a domain. Of course, you, you put in the AI and tech and then you, you, you achieve ops tech. Then you then talk about smart city, transport. I mean, that's a completely different domain. Just wanted to know how you manage to pivot, how you manage to get the experts in, how do you even manage to convince your board that it was not risky enough to you know, really be so spread out. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. It's already on. It's already on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, you, in your question, you alluded to there's many different stakeholders. Uh, to, yeah. I think um, uh, if it comes down to it, there, there's, if I have to pick three things, right, that was most important. I think the first one is um, looking at opportunities uh, you know, on a much more macro, longer term. Right? There are certain things that you know, if you look at it, you know, if you look at it the right way, like healthcare and stuff, you know, um, there's no doubt there's huge potential in it, right? And I think as an entrepreneur, uh, or a corporate entrepreneur, as Professor Hunk uh, said, you have to have that mindset because the common problem of being corporate is that you got what you have uh, instead of looking at new opportunities, right? Uh, so I think that is a very key thing uh, for, um, you know, for creating new businesses. So you always have to keep an eye on the opportunities. And then the way that I tell when we form our teams, be it when we start off as projects, or as project teams, or as companies, is that, look, your job is to figure out how to get there. Do not ever doubt that that is like, it's like standing on a very tall mountain. You can definitely see there's a very tall mountain over there. Right? But the actual path will be very difficult. Right, because from one tall mountain to another, you have to cross through streams and rock. But that's, the, that's what the team is supposed to do. Right? So I think that is very important because it gives confidence that you know, failure is part of it. Right? Because it's about finding the right way to get there. Right? So I think that's one um, uh, key thing. The second thing about talent and people, which is a common mistake that people make too, is that you know, um, you're worried, oh, not so, not so certain. Let's not invest so much money. I said the complete... It's a complete wrong mindset. You by, by definition, you will set yourself up for failure. Um, to, because it's a new opportunity, because it's so hard to crack, you have to find the best people and the most professional people to do it. So for almost all, we have, of course, an incubation process, much very systematically. But once we decide to form a company, right, that's when we said, look, we are very serious about it. We hire professionals in it. Uh, you know, it, because you and and we don't, we are not afraid to pay for it and get the best professionals to do that. Instead of using always the same folks and say, oh, why don't we make it work first before we invest the money? So I think the people is a very important part of it. So we are able. So me as an individual, I may not be able to be conversant in all, but you know, if you are able to set up different teams, they are able then to expand dramatically the spectrum much more. So I think that would be the second one. And I think the third one is about how you look at economics, right? Um, and sometimes it's very, it's very frustrating. I sometimes also have uh, difficult discussions uh, with our, our stakeholders to be. Um, I think it's about, again, it's about mindset, how, how you see it, right? Uh, if you want me to put a business case up front, you know, business case, I mean, I'm analytics in there. I can make a business case however I want to. Doesn't mean that it's right. Doesn't mean that the... The assumptions that I've put, I mean, if I haven't even started, you know, whatever assumptions I put, you can say whatever to it. So I think the way we think about it is more as a option to value. Like any of the businesses that we talk, we are a very large organization, as you can see. The tax I pay every day is 50 million US dollars. 50 million US dollars can hire a lot of very good people to try some things. So what if I fail? Even if I have a 10% chance of failure, as long as one out of 10 is successful, look at the unicorns and valuation that we've created. We've created 70 billion US dollars in value you know, in just eight years. Right? So the amount, I think, is if you think about in that terms, right, um, and have that right conversation with stakeholders, I think it will be a very, very different mindset. And you'll create a culture that's much more open uh, to trying out uh, new things. Yeah. Wow, that is a very unique uh, corporate... Uh venture kind of thinking that uh, when, when uh, venture capital cap, cap, venture capitalists funded startup, that was the mindset yeah. and you managed to uh, incorporate it in the organization and that is that's fantastic. 
Now, uh, any second questions? Ah, at the back? Yes, please. Mm. Hi, good evening. Hi, thank you for sharing. Shamir from uh, Versafleet. I'm a founder of a deep tech company in uh, logistics technology. Incidentally, FairPrice Online is one of my customers, so we should have a conversation. Uh, I have a two-part question. So, uh, there's an interesting authority in the space of AI, uh, Dr. Lee Kai Fu. Uh, among other books he wrote is uh, AI Superpowers, right? And he talks a lot about US and China and how there's this virtual cycle of uh, data and AI breakthroughs. And so, the first question is, in that framing, uh, framing of uh, the state of AI in the projections, where does it put Singapore? You know, what are our opportunities given, you know, our diminutive, <laughs> and um, you know, we, we don't really have a critical mass uh, to create those kind of virtual cycles. Uh, second part relating to that, there is a slightly technical. There's a, this this thinking that the breakthroughs in AI, the fundamental breakthroughs, are actually enough to propel the field for at least the next five ten years, right? So we see breakthroughs like uh, in GPT three, you have generative adversarial networks, and, and so on, generative transformers. Uh, is this true? And if it is, therefore, does it mean as companies, startups, looking to do that breakthrough, we should focus less on the, uh, the scientific breakthroughs, but more on the engineers to, to work on those prior breakthroughs forward? Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so I think to your first part, um, there is no doubt that US and China will be the best place for AI. Because they have the four ingredients necessary. They have a huge market. They have the data. They have the best talents. They have the money to actually make this work. So I, I, if you're an AI, there's no better place than these two places to do that. Um, and therefore, what, you know, what does that leave you know, places like Singapore and others? Um, I think it, you, we will not be able to create a whole market and ecosystem. But you know, in my mind, AI is, will be, is, it will be like, it's like today you say, I, I am a company, but I don't want to have app, right? 10 years ago, people would say, oh, should I have that or not? AI will be like this, it's as easy as you breathe and you drink. Right? Um, and I think this concept of democratizing AI and making use will be pervasive in any country, any industry, it's just a matter of time and speed. Right? So in that sense, there's always a role that we can do. I was, uh, we were speaking with Professor Hang and stuff, what NUS is doing, what Singapore government is doing, trying to create, what ASTAR is doing. I think these are all good uh, efforts and the models will come. Uh, so I'm less, less worried about that. I think it's much more about being plugged in and not doing it in isolation, right? Uh, that you do AI for sale by integrating with, you know, working with industries, et cetera, to do that. I think your second question about um, uh, you no know, GPT-3 and others is is amazing. In fact, I, when they first launched, I tried so hard to get an account just to see whether it's you no know, real or not. Uh, it's, it opens up so many possibilities uh, to do that. Um, I think the pure AI companies on how to make it commercially viable as pure AI, I think, still requires um, a lot of maturing and testing out. Right? I mean. If, um, if you looked at US in the past seven years or so, there have been a lot of flurry of these AI companies uh, that either uses tools, you know, they try to sell you know, AI as a tool, et cetera. Actually, other than the big, the Googles and the likes, right, uh, that's funded, um, there, there have been no very successful, uh, you know, small startup. Because I think it cannot be done in isolation uh, in that sense. So I think, um, I, I think in this particular area, uh, you know, they will still trying to find where it would be. Uh, but I think the key is really uh, not so much I'm an AI company, but more on what value are you trying, what problem and value are you trying to solve? And AI is just a tool in order to do that. Uh, I think that will probably guide some of the business models much more practically. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ms. Tan, for sharing. I think uh, in view of time, I'd like to switch over to some questions from the online. Uh, um. Questions again? Sure. Yeah, would, would okay. you like to, uh, the uh, first question is, uh, thanks for sharing your great business success is there. 
any message or insights specifically for students? Yeah. Uh, I, I, part of me uh, wanting to do this was really as students, you're in a wonderful time. I look back, you know, I wish I could redo my uh, you know, university again. Uh, I think it's, I, if I look back at what I didn't do as well, I, um, already I, you know, it's focusing too much on the hard curriculum. Right? Uh, you know, looking back, you know, I'm, you know, I'm proud to be from MIT, but I can unfortunately say I cannot remember most of the things that they taught me. <laughs> it's not to say that it's not important, like, um, because in these days, you know, with Google, it makes everyone so much smarter. Uh, yeah, I can forget how to solve a certain equation and stuff, but, you know, there are people that can solve it. But I think it's much more, I think the hard curriculum for me is much more about how you think in a very rigorous and systematic way, that you understand the concepts that you can actually apply and so that you know when you someone proposes an idea, you know, that, does this make sense, you know, logically and stuff like that. I think that's a basic foundation. But spend much more time on actually, you know, doing stuff. Uh, that's one of the things I love and remember about it. Um, that's why uh, a lot of people know that, you know, my daughter, after my, my, when, when my daughter finished PSL, the first thing I do is ship them to China for internship. Even as a 12 year old, I say, I don't care what you do. Right? Uh, I have my companies rotate them to do stuff, um, you know, writing app, doing user requirements. Uh, and I think earlier that you can expose yourself to real practical problems, uh, I think the better. Be it research projects, be it internships, you know, any, anything is good. I think sometimes we are a bit more too picky about what is it uh, that we do. You know, um, my first job was actually uh, folding envelopes for Steve Bank in the trade development shop. Right? That gave me insight into how trade processes were so, were so bad, right? And it's never changed. Letter of credit are still the same and stuff like that. Uh, that inspires us for the kind of a blockchain trade platform or how you do this. So I think all these would be very good, um, you know, and I would really encourage, especially in these days, be it NUS or others, all have these very wonderful opportunities uh, that you should spend, you know, a lot of your time uh, doing that. I think that will come very useful later on, yeah. Wow, thanks, Ms. Tan, for reminding the students that it's just, it is a process that is much more important, yeah. Uh, you have uh, the other questions? No, the, the previous one? I thought you have one more. Just now you have one question uh, about... Oh. Earlier on? Ah, this one, just stay on. Would you like to... Take on this. Sure, no I uh, would love to hear Jessica's personal story as a Singaporean in Sunchen and in Tuping An. How would a Singaporean take part of the greater Bay Area opportunity? Yeah. So, so I, I should be doing a relatively okay job because I managed to convince Bin Ru and uh, Tim Beng to join as well. Um, I, I think. Um, we are actually quite fortunate um, to be schooled right at I was very thankful that we have a, a bilingual education that allows us to be able to operate uh, quite efficiently. Uh, and I think um, when you go into a new country, um, you know, no matter where it is, there will always be lots of um, uh, challenges and barriers. I, I used to joke, I think the first year with my chairman, I said, you know, I have three gaps with you. I have a generation gap a cultural gap and a language gap. Uh, so I'm going to try very, very hard uh, to work uh, together. Uh, but I think um, these things, uh, if you focus on um, over time, these things get better and better. Different companies, different countries all have their way of working, right? Uh, but you find that if uh, you focus a lot on what is it that we're trying to do, right? Uh, and you focus on results and stuff like that, um, a lot of things uh, become much... So people get to... I adapt to them, people also adapt to me. Uh, they know that uh, I, you know, in meetings I also said, I, I, I said my Chinese is good, but it's not great enough to be able for me to phrase things in such a polite way. So please don't be offended if I say things bluntly as it is. Uh, and at the beginning, some people do take offense to it, but over time, actually, people uh, not only accepted it, I actually liked it, uh, that they know that when I say something, I don't mean any harm. Uh, you know, I simply say, of course, I joke, it's because I try, it's not good. But I think it also creates this as people get to you know you more and more. Uh, so I think um, uh, these can all be overcome uh, so long as you've, you know, the thing that you do is meaningful. 
and then you build success over time, then more and more people will want to join you. Uh, my first, first data scientist is not just about Singaporean, uh, even cross-industry people. My first chief data scientist I hired from Silicon Valley. Even though he's a Chinese, he's been with, uh, he's been US working for Microsoft, Google, etc. you know, for 15 plus years. Uh, when he accepted that offer, because I interviewed him over, uh, you know, phone, uh, you know, I was worried that, you know, maybe, it, will he really come? Uh, so I actually met him uh, in Capentino in the dim sum restaurant where I was there for him, just to make sure that he knows. Today, you know, he has, um, he oversees our 3,000 data scientists. Uh, he's never done financial services the day in his life. Uh, you know, but you know, because he likes the problems that, uh, that we're working on, it's having real impact. And I think that appeals to people. Uh, so I, uh, that's one of the things that can break down what I say a lot about cultural and language barriers uh, across a diversity of people. It's particularly important because a lot of innovation comes with actually cross-sector, uh, cross-discipline. Uh, Thai people, uh, you know, and it's not just nationality, uh, and I, uniting them on the problem. Uh, so, Tim Bing, for example, as a doctor trained, he has to work with our insurance, our tech people and stuff, um, and uh, at the beginning it's always tough, uh, but it will get better and better uh, doing that. Yeah. Thank you. I think in view of time, I'd like to switch back to the audience here. I see... Uh, uh, okay, so we have uh, one last question uh, from Mr. Mr. Lim. Uh, Jesse, awesome and uh, very amazing uh, presentation and uh, accomplishment. I have just one question for you. Um, central banks all over the world are introducing central bank digital currencies. And, and China is the first country in the world to do that. So do you see the central bank digital currency more you know, of a boon, a asset, or a threat? In what way? To your business? Uh, so, um, as digital currencies, um, uh, I do think that it is natural that central banks over time have their own digital currencies. It's no different than what they do from paper money to more digital electronic statement, and then now it's just the latest using blockchain as the underlying token and stuff. Uh, so from that standpoint, it is, it is no different for players. It's not a threat uh, you know, at, in any sense of the word, but it's more an upgrading of the whole system. Right? Because in, even in the electronic um, money system, because you can argue what's the difference between a digital currency versus an electronic system, there's still a lot of checks and compliance. You look at, you know, FACTA, you look at KYC, anti-money laundering, that you're not able to do that, right? And if you imagine really digital currencies throughout, then every single transaction uh, is being done. Uh, so I think from a central bank standpoint, it's very appealing uh, to have that and very natural to do so. Uh, China having invested, I think we want the early groups in the Pioneer, this, they have been doing this at, almost six years uh, now, right? Uh, um, and I think for the rest of us, it's more about how do you adapt uh, to this? Uh, and I think, um, you know, um, beyond just the digital currencies, are there more applications you can use beyond, right? I'm much more interested in tokenization of assets, right? Because digital assets are much more important. It's not just cryptocurrency, which is a lot of people hyped about but it's about assets and how do you create a digital footprint whereby you can price, you can you know, transfer, you can do in many different things on a, uh, you know, a smart ledger uh, for every asset to do that. And I think there's huge opportunities to do that. Uh, so we talked about, in fact, um, insurance contract being uh, you know, digital contract whereby, or a car, so we're, we've talked about car, when you buy second-hand car, you don't know whether this has been you know, uh, accident or not. You know, if everything have a digital racket uh, in that, you know, one day it will actually make it a much more efficient uh, thing. So I think this is a, a exciting long-term trend to do that. Or even carbon trading, uh, that's a digital asset too that you can actually uh, measure and, um, and transfer. Um, I was told that we can have a little bit yes. more time. So any more questions from the audience here? Yes, uh, Amit Jain. Thank you. My name's Amit Jain. I'm from Faculty of Engineering here. I, 
questions. Um, we've heard a lot about your experiences in Ping An and how you developed the company. I think a lot of our NUS students would be very interested in learning how you reached Ping An. What happened before? Because they're more in that stage than in the later senior yeah, yeah, executive yeah. stage. So that'd be great. Yeah. You, you mean from a personal perspective, my, my life before Ping Yeah, so yeah. NUS, MIT, yeah. and then Ping An, but there's a black hole in the sure. middle. Sure, sure. So oh, my life is very, very, very well, it's going to be as simple as it's complicated. Uh, so I, I um, uh, did up to JC here in Singapore, in Singapore, and then I did my bachelor's and master's in MIT. Uh, I was then um, in McKinsey for 13 years, uh, where I traveled uh, globally uh, as a partner. So I was in the US, I worked in Europe, 10 different countries in Asia. Uh, I was in Thailand during the two coup, where you know, once I was even six months pregnant, uh, where the tax came. Uh, you know. so, so I worked um, through, McKinsey had a very good exposure to different industries, different countries and stuff. Um, and before I joined Ping An, was, Ping An was my first client um, in 2003 when I first moved back from the US and at that time, uh, they were even smaller than the picture that I said, and I really actually didn't want to go. <laughs> uh, but I, I think I've, um, you know, over time, grew to love it. Um, if I were to summarize, I think uh, there's a few unique things. Um, uh, one is that um, I, I do have an engineering science background, but my husband, who is a physics you know, master say that you know I can't really be claimed to do science and stuff, um, but but I think it provides a very good rigorous foundation for me. Right, that's why I approach problem in a very very systematic, analytical way. Uh, and you'll be amazed at what plus minus times divide can actually create insights uh, in a sense. So I, I think that's a good foundation. I think the second one that has helped me significantly, my 13 years at McKinsey, has taught me to look at business problems on a very large scale. Uh, you know, I've done retail industries uh, in, in the dot-com days. I did it the, both the boom as well as helping bankrupt companies. Uh, you know, I worked in even Russia before. Uh, you know, you see to learn to think about problems as well as work with many different types of people. Uh, sometimes where I don't even speak uh, the language. And that has provided very good uh, skills for me uh, and not um, afraid to look at things that I may not know. Because we always have, uh, you know, in McKinsey, you, it's about what questions you ask uh, to get the answers. Not, I, I don't pretend that I know the answers right off bat. And I think that gives you the confidence to approach opportunities and problems and working out uh, together uh, with the people. So I think these will be helpful things uh, along the way that have accumulated. And then I think at Peng An, my biggest learning, and that's why I lo love so much, is that, you know, I was a lot more thinker beforehand because as consultants, you think you saw many problems intellectually, you're always at the cutting front. But now, the past eight years, I love doing it. Um, I love being able to have people, we try it out, instead of agonizing, is this right or wrong? And, and we failed before, I, I haven't, because of an interest time, I didn't really say the stuff that I failed. Uh, you know, my second year, uh, you know, I had to close 77 branches, 500 people. Uh, we grew really fast. Um, you know, we were trying to experiment at that time, the last mile where we set up these shops, um, you know, we embed in like condos and stuff. Uh, and, you know, it worked, but the economic was too long, right? So when my chairman asked me, I was, I, you know, I pleaded with him, please give me, you know, one more year to try uh, to do it. So I've closed companies, I've closed things, but, you know, we find that oh, through this, you become more and more resilient, tougher, you know then, you know, what you should try, not try. Uh, and, in, and no failure is for waste. So the 77 branches I closed to today, I can still remember. You know, three years later, we repeated that, but in our bank branch. So instead of having a standalone thing, we just basically, instead of people now you know, having smaller and smaller bank, we actually now make a bigger bank branch. Since I'm already investing to have a real estate in the last mile, I'm going to make it bigger, such that all my, my agents can bring them there to do other stuff for the last mile for customer fare. And it works brilliantly. Uh, you know, we are now all across with this. So I think every failure comes with that. Uh, and the doing part uh, is quite important. Uh, you know, there's sometimes people like talk and think a lot, but don't do. Uh, and I think you actually, once you do, you can actually do a lot of things and learn, yeah. Thank, thank you. I think I will take this as a last question from the online. Uh, the question is about uh, what is the competitive advantage of Ping An being 
uh, coming from a financial service group uh, transform into a tech-driven ecosystem powerhouse versus another tech company that try to enter the financial services? Yeah, I, I think these are two very, very different paths. Uh, for a tech company, actually more like internet companies, um, their strength is in having lots of online users right, uh, who don't make as much money <laughs> uh, as we do. Right? If you look at our numbers, um, you know, you're making a few tens of billions of uh, profit every year. You know, uh, you take Ali, Tencent, etc. Combined, they make less profits than we we do, right? Uh, but they have huge customer base, uh, and technology is, well, of course, one of the enablement. And therefore, financial services is an additional thing that they can expand, right? Uh, so that's where their strength is. So what you see when they enter financial services is that they tend to go for mass, small ticket size, right? So I mentioned the loans that we talked about. Uh, you know, the internet will give a few. Uh, uh, so it's more like. One, two thousand loans, small little pocket money loans, cash loans, where you maybe I buy e-commerce, I do an installment. For us, we focus our online loans is a few hundred thousand loans for SME owners who want to do their business. So very different type mm. uh, of area uh, to do that. Uh, and I think each one have our strengths, uh, but it doesn't prohibit, I don't think we always start with the idea of, oh, I'm disadvantaged uh, in that sense. Um, you know, uh, as you can see, even us as uh, financial services, we can also view from 50 million to 598 million internet users in just eight years. Eight years is a very small uh, few, a few number of times, and it shows that any industry, you know, should not be too afraid of that, oh, people are enroging. There are also core competence that we can do, the sector is big enough uh, to come up with different things to do, yeah. Okay, I think uh, it's time for me to close the session. Thank you very much for your questions. Can I ask you to join me to thank uh, Ms. Thank Tan you. again? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tan and Professor Hung. May I now invite Associate Professor Daniel Chua, Director, Office of Alumni Relations and Development, to close the session. We have come to the end of the 2021 NUS Distinguished Leaders Lecture. Ms. Tan's sharing is especially impactful to me as the Director of the Office of Alumni Relations and Development as it is a shining example of what engineers can achieve at the highest level. I hope our alumni gathered here and online would take heart from what she has shared and that the lecture has opened their minds to opportunities and paths that they can seek going ahead. We have, in fact, in the audience a few of our young alumni who have already started to make their mark in the world. I hope this lecture and connections you make today will continue to spur your achievements ahead. Now, I would like to invite our Dean, Professor Aaron Tian, to present to Ms. Tan a token of appreciation for sharing her time with us today. Prof Tian, please. Okay, thank you everyone. So now we have come to the official closing of 2021 Distinguished Lecture Series. On behalf of everyone, I would like to thank you all here for taking your time to this evening. We hope to see you again in another lecture series later. Good night all of you. <laughs>